to the third um, STAR lecture series of our year. Today we have Professor Jan Skaluba, member of the Royal Society and the Jordan Bank, the Jordan Bank Center of Astrophysics, all of our very own. And um, he is a specialist on, this, on the spectral distortions of the CMB, which is, um, for, the astro, for the astrophysics lovers, the, one of the, the arguably most important aspects of the cosmology. So let's hear from Professor Jan Skoub about the hunting for new treasures with special distortions of the CMB. Thank yeah, thanks a lot. Um, uh, really happy that, I can, uh, uh, that we could make it, uh, find a time to do this. Um, I really, I know that this is going to be a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to give you a really uh, you know, broad overview of what spectral distortions are about. But because I, I understand that many of you have not even seen cosmology or taken cosmology yet, so I will have to try to give you a little bit of like you know a full crash course in cosmology as well. Um, so it's going to be challenging, but let's see where we get. And I think don't be afraid. Just ask me if there is something that's unclear. I will try to elaborate and just stop me, and, and I can try to you know uh, give a little bit more detail. So spectral distortions are. Uh, to me, uh, definitely something that uh, will be really uh, helping us to understand a lot more about cosmology and a lot more about the early universe. And that is what I really want to uh, achieve uh, with this lecture as well, that you actually afterwards, uh, hopefully you go away and say, yes, spectral distortions is something cool we can really work on and look for. Okay, so cosmology uh, is about, uh, of course, the large, uh, larger scales, the universe we live in. And we have this picture uh, of the history of the universe where things start with the Big Bang and you know, small quantum fluctuations, as we believe, get blown up to the macro macroscopic scales by this uh, state, uh, uh, very, very rapid expansion, which is called the inflation uh, era. Um, these quantum fluctuations, which are density perturbations in the universe, they are then the seeds of structures later in the universe for you know, uh, stars and galaxies and all these things that we, when we uh, go and look with telescopes, we can see around us. Right? Uh, there's also a very crucial era, which is called the recombination era. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit as well. So it's really important to realize that uh, the universe is initially very hot and dense, so that everything is fully ionized plasma. It's mainly hydrogen and helium. So very simple in that sense, very simple atomic physics. Go into calculating how the plasma, once, once it cools down, actually recombines and allows photons to pro propagate through the universe. So think of the universe in the early stages as totally opaque where photons uh, cannot really you know, go very far without interacting with some of the electrons and the uh, matter in the universe. But then later, after the recombination era, uh, the photons basically propagate freely to us. Right? And the recombination era is, is roughly 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, very, very crucial era in the universe. OK, so cosmology, as I said, is about the big questions. What is the universe made of? How did it start? Uh, what produced those initial conditions? And uh, what, you know, uh, how did all the structures and so on form? And the cosmic microwave background is one of the uh, key pieces of information in this respect. Um, so these tiny fluctuations of the temperature of the microwave background uh, in the different directions of the sky, they tell us about uh, the, the properties of the universe. So this is a picture taken by the Planck uh, satellite, which is an ESA, it was an ESA mission that was for many years mapping uh, the sky um, in the microwaves, really uh, the microwave, uh, uh, you know, in the centimeter uh, bands, if you will, decimeter and centimeter bands, and taking, um, comparing basically the flux of photons in different directions. That gives you this beautiful map 
on the sky. And if you look at this map, you see that there's uh, some fluctuations. The fluctuations, the level of these fluctuations is 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 100,000. So uh, the real sky is actually much more bright. But when you look at the variations in the temperature, you see that there is uh, tiny, tiny fluctuations of the temperature in different directions. And that is nothing else than saying, well, these different parts of the universe have slightly different densities and therefore different tem temperatures. And these uh, perturbations in the universe tell you something about cosmology. Yeah? Um, going into exact detail how all that works is probably going to be a bit too much, but I will try to give you a sketch at least of how this works. So uh, just to emphasize how this was really done, right? The Planck satellite is, uh, is a satellite mission that was uh, flown uh, in the, in the, you know, uh, around 2009, 2007, 2009. And um, it was a mapping essentially in the microwaves, as I said, the sky, uh, doing these uh, with, with a beam scanning the sky. And as the Earth uh, uh, orbits around the sun, it covered uh, essentially the full sky, uh, just producing these uh, maps of the sky. It was actually spinning uh, in such a way that it, every half a year, it was producing basically one full sky map. Yeah? And then uh, this, you unfold this, you know, think of the sphere and you just unfold it on the sky. That's how you produce the sky map. But you see here, I, I told you the beautiful map that I showed you, right? But here, when you look at what Planck was actually measuring, do you guys have any idea what this really is here? Because this doesn't look like, like what I showed you, right? So what, what, is, what is really happening here? Milky Way, yeah. And in particular, it's the dust emission from the Milky Way. So uh, if you look at the higher lat latitudes, so this is the plane of the Milky Way, and the higher, lat uh, you know, higher, uh, 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 farther away from the, uh, from the Milky Way, you can see a little bit of these fluctuations, right? So this is the CMD anisotropies that give you the cosmological information, and this is foregrounds, what we call foregrounds. This is what you have to get rid of to really extract the information. Um, and uh, yeah, the, this is the galactic dust emission and also synchrotron emission depending on which frequencies you look at. Look at yeah? So here's just you know, some of the foregrounds that you had to deal with to get to the cosmologically interesting signals. You had to remove the thermal dust, free free emission, right? Bremsstrahlung, just electrons zooming around uh, nuclei, in, in particular hydrogen uh, uh, protons. And then spinning dust, that's uh, like small little particles that are aligning with the magnetic fields in the universe, in the galaxy, and spinning, and therefore having uh, optical properties that give you uh, some emission. And then synchrotron emission, where you have the electrons just zooming around the magnetic fields. Right? So these are things that you have to s subtract and get rid of in order to go to this beautiful sky map. Okay, so now we have this beautiful sky map, and I skipped many, many aspects. So, for example, we're moving with respect to the microwave background. Therefore, we actually, the largest, uh, um, the largest fluctuation that you see is a CMB dipole, which is just coming from the fact that we're having, you know, relativistic boosting uh, with respect to the microwave background, and we are seeing basically for in the forward direction more photons or hotter photons, higher energy photons coming than in the backward direction. This is a really special relativity for you, yeah? All right, good. So uh, this sky map, one of the important things is that it's actually, um, uh, it's actually extremely, uh, the information, you could in principle look at and count here all the peaks, and this is like several million uh, uh, peaks, if for the Planck uh, case at least. Um, uh, but uh, the, the, all the information in there is actually something you can compress m way more. You don't have to look at the details of, oh, there's a little bit of cold here and there's a little bit of hot. So the red ones are the hot ones. I should have mentioned that. Um, and there's like these, you know, the larger scale correlations. Not, the information that's in there is actually not in the detail, but it's in the more overall statistical properties. And we will get to that in a second. Okay, so. Uh, one of the things that I think is really a nice uh, picture, by the way, to think about, should we maybe switch off the front light? I'm just realizing that might be a little better to see then. Yeah. We're not following it this way, no? Okay. Okay, so one of the really uh, nice uh, pictures that is going back to Douglas Scott, one of the uh, you know, leading cosmologists in Canada, in fact, he was also one of the team members of the Planck satellite, right? um, is this inside-out star analogy of our universe. So in cosmology, uh, 
we are always like at the center of our observation, right? So we are here in the center of this inside out star. If we go back uh, in redshift or in time, so we look at more distant objects, like the cosmic microwave background, which is quite distant, we will get to that uh, in a bit, then uh, we are going back in time and we're going more distant. That's like us going from the, uh, from the outside of the star more towards the center of the star. So you will see uh, when I flip in a second. So the universe is basically this uh, shell structure where we are in this, uh, we are here in the center of the cosmology, and as we go farther away, we go to hotter and hotter phases of the universe. And the core of the star can be thought of uh, in this, you know, in this most outer uh, shell, which is the most distant, which is close to the Big Bang, if you will. Yeah. So as I already told you, in the early phases, higher redshifts. The universe is ionized, and you have a plasma phase where, where the electrons and protons zoom around, and you get the recombination arrow, which is the surface of last scattering. So the photons are before, they are just going, uh, moving around, but then the electrons disappear, and the photons start finally coming towards us, and you can actually observe them more or less on straight lines. Yeah? And uh, uh, this redshift here is redshift 1000. Um, that corresponds to this 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Okay, so that, that's, that's the universe as an inside-out star. Here is the star, uh, where the star center is, as I said, is here. And this is the last scattering surface where we see the anisotropies in the universe uh, appear. That is basically the photosphere of the, star, of the sun or of the star, right? So the, the, the part where we really see the light from is, is just a very narrow shell on the star surface where, where you have the photosphere uh, emitting light that actually reaches you. And also photons that are in the center of a star. Has, does anybody know how long it takes for a photon from the center of the sun to come to us? So it is actually a very good analogy because a photon in the center of the star takes about a million years to get out because it's scattering so many times it gets basically uh, absorbed and emitted, re-emitted many, many times. And only when it comes to the part where the, where the star surface is becoming uh, more, you know, where you're closer to the surface, you can actually get this, uh, the photons out. So this is really an interesting analogy, which also is the same here in the universe, because the last scattering surface is when we are starting to see um, information from the inside of the star, in some sense. Yeah? And this analogy is really nice, because it also reminds us that, well, when we do studies of stars, we can ask about their patterns of oscillations and vibrations. So a star is a, is a gas ball, right? In, in many, uh, in simple, in simple words, and it has certain pressure waves that go through that are driven by, of course, the production of energy in the center of the star, and then gravity pulling things and so on, right? And these pressure waves, is, you can think of it as, as a ringing of a of a bell in some sense. These, the structure of these waves, these pressure waves, which you can indeed measure by looking at stellar uh, spectra. They tell you about the structure of the star. And in a similar way, by looking at the patterns on the sky uh, of the microwave background, you can actually learn about what the properties of, this, of the matter is, of the, uh, the universe is. And the way we compress this, here you're, comp you're, you're looking at these patterns on the you know, surface of the star, if you will, and the information that you get about the oscillations you have. Here, you can also do that, but the important thing is that the fluctuations on the sky are actually Gaussian. And Gaussian, you guys know, if you have a Gaussian, then you, you know, the width of the Gaussian defines all the higher order moments of the Gaussian. So if you take um, the width of the Gaussian, uh, it has a zero mean, around the mean it is uh, distributed symmetrically. Then if you take the third moment of the Gaussian, that's zero again. The fourth moment is defined by the second moment, and so on. So the Gaussian, a Gaussian statistics of Gaussian defines all the higher order properties of the of the uh, of the sky as well. And in a similar way, you can think about this for cosmology as well. You actually have the statistical properties of the sky being defined by basically the amplitude of uh, of the fluctuations at different scales. So, what does this really mean? Uh, here, it's basically multiple number. So multiple, you guys know what's spherical harmonics, right? Uh, you heard, heard about those, at least. Um, of course, everybody knows what the uh, L100 uh, um, uh, and M, uh, let's say, uh, 20. Please, what's the, what's the expression? 
tell me. No, no, I'm joking. This is, these are all very complicated expressions and it's useless to even know them, but they describe the sphere and they allow you to describe basically a picture that you have here. How can I just decompose this picture into spherical harmonics? You, you basically have a representation that gives you coefficients, the ALM coefficients, and if you then sum basically over every M state, you can get these uh, properties of the average properties of the uh, L coefficients. And if you look at this, this power spectrum, that's what we call this, in the temperature, you see that there is these oscillations here. And the first peak is roughly at one degree scale. So L of 200 roughly depends, uh, corresponds to, uh, to, L, uh, to a degree scale. And if you look at this, then the, uh, at the sky, the characteristic scale here is actually one degree. These are one degree patches on the sky that are the most visible modes that you see here. And these one degree, that's like 40,000 degrees uh, uh, on the sky, 40,000 of these patches on the sky, because 40,000 square de degrees is what you have on the full sky. Yeah? Um, in any case, uh, these, these modes, they tell you about the properties of the universe. So you measure this, and you look at this, and then you have these, red, uh, these uh, theoretical curves that are in there. And I will uh, you know, say a few words about that. But that's a prediction from a specific model. And you can understand if you have these measurements here, and the lines that you predict go through this, then you can determine parameters of the universe. Right? And that's exactly what we do in cosmology. We measure these beautiful patterns on the sky. We do this spherical harmonic decomposition. So we describe the sky using a basis, the spherical harmonics. And then we compress it into these power spectra. That's, that's what we as cosmologists do. We calculate the temperature power spectrum as a function of the multiple moment or as a function of the angular scale. Yeah? And then we can do this both in temperature, just what is the intensity on the sky, but we can also do it in polarization. So what's the different polarization degrees? This is really nothing else than polarized light, and you're asking now in which direction does it really oscillate. Right? And so then you can do polarization out of power, that's the E modes, and then you can do also cross correlations between temperature modes and, and, and E modes, and B modes, which we will mention in a second. So in any case, bottom line is, by measuring the sky, we have a lot of information that we can use to determine our models. And the models here that are shown, they are calculated with uh, so-called Boltzmann codes for cosmological perturbations, for, for example, CAMB and CLASS. And these are codes that some people have written, and you can basically predict for different parameters what the, you, what the properties should be in this, uh, in this uh, metric. Yeah? And so then, using this, together with other cosmological things, like supernova data, you know, the distances that we have measured and the, basically the expansion rate of the universe, um, or large-scale structure measurements, bionic acoustic, acoustic oscillation is 21 centimeter. I don't have time to go into all of these, but it's basically all these cosmological data sets that you put together and do a joint analysis, and then you're really happy because you obtain final parameters that tell you, uh, you know, okay, the bion density is this and this, the total matter density is this and this. Their total density is this and this. And you, you can, you know, these are some of the key parameters that we have uh, obtained with extremely high precision. Okay, again, I, I don't expect you to really understand exactly all the details, but just think of it, you measure the sky, you can compress the information, and you can compare with theories. So these lines are theoretical lines, and because these lines, they depend on the parameters, you can determine the parameters. It's like a fitting, but it's a very complicated fitting with a lot of physics going into it. And that, that, that would you know, be a, a whole lecture, well, multiple lectures on the on the, on the, on the, on the Okay, good. So with this, we have learned a whole lot about cosmology. So first thing, Big Bang, the Big Bang picture, picture where things started with a hot, dense phase and then expanded and so on, really passes all the uh, tests that we have been doing with flying colors. It's, it's really a, 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 a a, a physical scenario of the universe that works extremely well. We also have uh, proven that inflation, uh, which is this rapid expansion at the very early phases, actually predicts um, the fluctuations that we see um, uh, to extremely high precision as well. So inflation is something that we, are, uh, we don't have a fundamental theory for it. It's a phase in the universe, in the very early universe, 
um, but we are trying to uh, learn about that by studying these microwave background properties. And some of the main parameters, like the bio density, the dark matter density, energy, the dark energy density, all these have been measured to extremely high precision. So I, I see already some faces like, okay, what is dark matter, what is dark energy? And you probably heard about this. These are components that we have no idea about. We, we just know that the universe says there should be 25% in terms of the total energy budget, 25% dark matter. Uh, what we are made of, the bionic matter, is only 5%. So really tiny fraction of what we are seeing um, is really the, the uh, of we, uh, you know, we are a very tiny fraction of what we really see in the universe. And then the dark energy, that's responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe that we are actually seeing uh, with cosmological measurements like the supernova data. Again, this would be really exciting to talk about and all, but I, I, I want to just give you the sketch. We know things very, very extremely well now, and the microwave background is one of the things that have taught us so much about this. Uh, I did mention in passing these polarization measurements, and I showed you the Planck temperature sky map, this beautiful uh, you know, map. Planck has also produced a polarization sky map. So this is now uh, illustrating not only the amplitude of the polarization, but also the directions. You can see these swirly patterns here. And they are coming from scattering physics, and you know, it's basically nothing else than electrons uh, scattering uh, light with different degree of polarization, and then uh, re basically reshuffling all the information. Yeah? And uh, this is, as I said, the second uh, aspect of the microwave background that we can use to learn about cosmology. And uh, one of the things that we have actually derived from that is uh, an understanding of the magnetic fields in our universe, in our, uh, sorry, in our galaxy. Because the dust emission that I told you about, how, you know, that's one of the brightest signals you see when you look at the sky. That dust emission comes from, um, ultimately from magnetic fields and the electrons and uh, other particles uh, aligning in these magnetic fields. So then by measuring polarization, from these, from these signals, you can actually learn about the structure of the magnetic fields, which is really exciting, and a lot of uh, you know, physics goes into this, producing this beautiful map, which you know, reminds you of some Monet uh, kind of painting, um, which is really, really uh, great. And um, uh, we, as cosmologists, are really excited, probably most excited, about um, going from measurements of the E modes, which are, which are shown here, these are the measurements before I showed you always the data points uh, for the temperature modes, so outer power, power of temperature fluctuations, but here you have now the power of the E mode uh, uh, the polarization patterns, and then also the cross power between temperature and E modes. You can basically say, okay, how do, when there is a large uh, temperature fluctuation, how much polarization fluctuation do I have in that direction? And that cross correlation is, is this as a function of the multipole or scale again, yeah? Um, and the difference, the, or the important thing, E modes are these modes that have, uh, they are looking like uh, modes that are familiar from electric field uh, with a divergence, and the B modes are the ones that have, are divergence free, that have a curl component. That's how we actually distinguish these patterns on the sky. And the crucial thing is that E modes can be produced by scalar fluctuations. So the density is a little higher than, than there, or then you can get E modes. But when you want to have uh, B modes, they are coming from tensor perturbations, so gravitational waves going through the universe, if you will. This is complicated to explain exactly, but um, these modes, they tell you about the Big Bang again in a very specific way, and that's something that people are very excited about. So, uh, we have also other really nice measurements. So, for example, here is the Coma Cluster. It's one of the biggest uh, clusters of galaxies that we have in our neighborhood. Um, it is, you know, it, it is, uh, here is a, a picture where I also put the X-ray image of it. So there's hot gas in this, uh, in this cluster. It is made of, you know, a thousand or more galaxies. Um, it's a very large galaxy cluster, and it is, uh, uh, you know, some hundred megaparsecs away uh, at a redshift of 0 0.0231. Uh, it is like about a de two degrees on the sky. The moon. Does anybody know how big the moon, moon is on the sky? When you look at the moon in the evening, how big is that? How much is that? That's roughly half a degree across. So the CD temperature fluctuations are about twice the, the diameter of the moon, if you would be comparing. 
Uh, and this is another factor of two uh, bigger than the typical scale of the temperature fluctuations. Yeah? So this is a pretty big thing on the sky. And it has this hot gas that you can actually see in Bramstrahlung. And the cool thing is that when you have this hot gas, these are pockets of, 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 of hot gas in the universe, when you now are a CMB photon and you're going through this hot gas, you, uh, you can receive energy from this hot gas. Because you basically think of it this way, the CMB photons are very low, low energy photons. They are microwave photons, so they have a very small energy. And you have this KV plasma there, so really hot uh, electrons that zoom around at a fair fraction of the speed of light. And these allow you, they can upscatter CMB photons, and that is leading to the so-called sunier sandwich effect, um, which is a, a very, very important tool for learning about uh, cosmology, in fact, because it can basically probe the existence of hot gas in that place, in that place, and that, you know, it's basically a way to test the presence of hot gas in the universe. And uh, here's a picture of this where you can think of it this way. You have a CMB photon from the black body distribution, and it is basically being upscattered, uh, which means that you have some removal of photons from low frequencies and some appearance of photons at higher frequencies. And depending on what's the temperature of the plasma, what's, you know, all these things, they play into the calculation of this. Again, a lot of physics goes into this, but it's basically nothing else than hot electrons they are like, oh, the CMB photon is really cold. I want to give it, give it a good beating so that it becomes higher energy and you basically transfer energy to the photon and in that way you can see uh, the cluster. And uh, this is, was predicted by Rashid Sunyaev, who, who was here very happy because uh, this method of seeing clusters has now been used very successfully in, uh, you know, in cosmology. This is a sky map, again, this you know, typical projection where, you, where all the clusters of galaxies are shown and uh, these were detected with the microwave uh, background measurements. So uh, we, this is an, even an old map because this was only a thousand objects. We now have like with uh, the so-called ACT um, uh, Atacama Cosmology Telescope, we have like uh, 4,000 or so uh, clusters that were detected in this effect. So this is a standard tool of looking for the large scale structure in the universe, the hot gas in the universe. Yeah? Really exciting. Again, lots of physics in there. It's, you know, one could talk about just this for you know, a long time. Then we have also like beautiful, beautiful uh, effects coming from gravitational lensing. So you all heard about Einstein's uh, general relativity. And if uh, you get this lensing effect, right, if you are uh, going as a photon close to a, a massive uh, concentration, you are receiving a deflection. So the photons from the microwave background from the last scattering surface, when they go through the structure of the universe, the dark matter in particular, they are deflected. They don't go on straight lines, but they, you know, wiggle around, and uh, therefore the map of the sky is distorted by this gravitational lensing effect when it re when we receive it. Yeah. Uh, so the observer here will see not the clean CMB sky, but a, a, a mapped, a remapped CMB sky, depending on what the structure of the universe is, and. This is here an illustration of this. Here is the background CMB unlensed. This would be straight line uh, trajectories. Well, depending on what the curvature of the universe is, it would still include the calculation of what curvature does. But you know, this is this. And if you now lens it with a typical you know, distribution of matter, you get this very small subtle effect. And one of the things this does is it changes the position of the, of the peaks relative to each other, and that introduces non-Gaussian structure. And now you can actually use that non-Gaussian structure to extract this effect. And it also does something to the E modes. Polarization gets mapped into B modes, which is another effect. And these are all just like, um, how to say, GR effects on the evolution of uh, uh, photons in the universe and all this. Again, very, very uh, many things go into this, and the calculation is quite uh, complicated. But the physical effect is very, very easy to understand. It's uh, fluctuations in the universe, the density fluctuations that deflect the photons, and uh, you get different uh, picture. And this has allowed us to actually reconstruct the large-scale distribution of dark matter in the universe. This is a beautiful map of the lensing potential. Uh, so if you want to describe how this remapping works, you need to say how much, how much power in lenses you have. And this is a map of that power, basically. So um, these are beautiful measurements, and they tell us again about the large-scale structure of the universe. 
Okay, so this is this is this is a lot, I know, uh, but it's really exciting because we have many many observables with the microwave background at the core of it, uh, you know, using it to to do things, and these measurements they were of course the accumulation of many many years of work uh, from uh, you know many many people. Uh, Starting with the Kobe satellite in the in the in, uh, um, late late um, uh, late 80s early 90s, then the WMAP satellite uh, and and the Planck satellite. I showed you many pictures or results from the Planck mission, and then there's of course many many other experiments, ground based and also balloon based experiments that have contributed to this. And this you know slide is summarizing just a few. This is not even all of them. Right. So this was a lot of activity, a lot of major push to understand our cosmology and get this, you know, um, percent level measurements of the, the parameters of the universe, which is really exciting and great, great. And there is some future ahead of us because we're having, of course, we're not stopping. We are wanting to look m for more, namely the B-mode signals, which, as, a, as I tried to sketch, to, uh, you know, come from gravitational waves going to the universe, for example. And that is really exciting because it tests the universe in the very early phases of the, of the cosmos. Because gravitational waves, when they go through the universe, they, they basically they, they feel nothing. They just travel. They can't be scattered. They, don't, they are not deflected. So it's really like the most, uh, how to say, early map of the sky you could ever think of making. Of course, really doing that from the cosmological point of view is not going to be uh, feasible because detecting these is really uh, a very challenging operation. But we can see what their imprint is on the microwave background sky. And that's the way uh, people are wanting to go forward with satellite missions like Lightbird, with ground-based missions like Simons Observatory, which is one of the key things that the UK is involved in as well. Uh, both of these are, in fact, UK uh, with a lot of involvement from the UK, also from Manchester in particular. Uh, and then there's even more ambitious things like PICO, which is a much, much bigger satellite mission, and then the CMB Stage 4 uh, initiative, which is basically a ground-based uh, campaign with many, many, many experiments contributing. And all these are, they're trying to, you know, look for these primordial uh, tensor modes, uh, which are telling us about uh, gravitational waves in the universe. Uh, and I think this is meaning there's lots of excitement and lots of uh, fun things we can do with cosmic microwave background and other topics. Temperature and polarization. Okay, so I spent half an hour on what I'm not wanting to talk about. But now let's go to what I want to talk about. So this is what I mainly talked about, the symbianas of Now we're forgetting about this. No, no, no anas of the, the signal that I'm now looking at is this. This is the monopole, just the average sky flux. So the monopole of the CMB, which normally uh, is not used, in any of the cosmological analysis directly, because it is, of course, spatially not very interesting. It's just isotropic on the sky. And there is, in particular, also no real prediction from cosmology for what the monopole should be. So it's a real parameter that you have to determine. And this parameter has been determined by, uh, again, Kobe, but now not the mapper, uh, which looked at the anisotropies for the first time and won the Nobel Prize for these measurements, but by the so-called FIRAS instrument which was allowing an absolute measurement of the sky. So, um, uh, I spoke about the anisotropies, which is basically saying, what's the temperature in that direction to that direction? That's just looking at one parameter, but as you know, when you're deciding to measure photons, you have actually, you can decide which wavelength you want to look at, right? And the dependence on wavelength is the other direction that the CMB has. And Kobe Fires has shown that the wavelength dependence or frequency dependence of the microwave background background sky on average, so no fluctuations, is actually extremely close to that of a black body. So the theoretical curve is this red curve. It covers the data points with their error bars. The, the measurement that Kobe Fires has done has basically proven that there is a black body spectrum on, on average in the sky. And these small fluctuations in the temperature are literally just like small perturbations to this black body spectrum in different directions. Okay. Again, this aspect uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2006. Uh, John Mada was the main PI of that experiment or of that uh, instrument on Kobe. And it has shown that the temperature of the CB today is 2.725 Kelvin with a pretty impressive, very, very small error bar. 
so small that basically nobody is even varying the temperature of the CMB ever in the analysis, although it is a parameter that you have to determine with this measurement. But there is these parameters, mu and y. These are, the, 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 uh, to leading order, the parameters that I'm interested in with spectral distortions, which are characterizing essentially departures of the spectrum, of the real spectrum in the universe, from that of a perfect black body. So if you say the spectrum is a black, uh, black body with really high precision, there's possibilities of having departures from that spectrum, and that get, tells you again about the early universe. And we are looking with spectral distortions, we're looking for departures from the black body spectrum. Okay, so why would you expect some departures? So this is this is uh, this is this can be understood in this way. Um, so if you're imagining you're a photon in the early universe, and uh, you know you have this very hot and dense phase, and then uh, cosmological expansion. In reality, you can show that if you don't have any specific collisions, uh, let's say with hot matter, like in clusters of galaxies. Uh, and the photons, you will not by expansion change anything about your, uh, the, the spectrum of the universe. So the, the, the photon spectrum will remain a black body spectrum if you just have the expanding universe. The only thing that happens is that the expansion cools the photon field, so the temperature initially is very high, and then linearly cools with redshift, goes down. So today the temperature is, as I said, 2.725, or 2.7255, therefore 26 here. Um, uh, and if you go to higher redshift, so redshift 1000, for example, you would have 3000 Kelvin. That's, by the way, another analogy, why this analogy with the star, inside-out star, is pretty good, because the photosphere of our sun is roughly 6000 Kelvin, right? So this is basically the last scattering surface of the, uh, of the, in the universe is basically happening very similar to the photosphere of a star, with, with some uh, important differences, of course. Uh, nevertheless, if you have the temperature for a black body, that fixes everything, right? As you know from, uh, uh, or will we'll learn in statistical mechanics, um, if you fix the temperature of a black body, you know exactly what the number density of the photons is in that black body, and you will also know what's the energy density. And uh, it basically is uh, meaning that you can map temperature and energy, uh, uh, energy density and en uh, number density are given by the temperature. So, if nothing special happens and you're just having the expanding universe, a black body stays a black body. That, that's the short story of what I was just saying. But, if you have some di disturbance of full equilibrium, if you put a hot pocket of, of gas in the universe and the photons go through it, they will be upscattered and they will receive energy. Then you don't have the uh, conservation of the spectrum anymore because you have actually done something to the spectrum and you create the so-called spectrum distortions. Um, and uh, the important thing is, and that it's, a, it's again, it's a complicated process. The important thing is when does it happen? So if you, if you do this very, very uh, uh, close by in a sense, so a cluster of galaxy, then you will certainly see today the distortion. But if you do this very early, so very close to the Big Bang, then there's so much time left in the universe to actually restore equilibrium again. So there is a question basically, when do you do this? Because that will tell you how much you might be able to see the signal today or not. Yeah? And there is processes in there which are, you know, branch traveling and double Compton and Compton scattering and uh, uh, it, again, it would take uh, quite some time to go through all of these, but they are basically scattering processes, yeah? which you, we can describe very precisely, in fact. So, uh, cos uh, black body, uh, uh, the, the spectral distortions are essentially about when does something happen to the, uh, to the spectrum in the universe and how does that manifest as signals. And that means that measuring the spectrum, you can actually learn something about the thermal history. When does energy uh, get injected or when do uh, particles get created in the universe? That's what you can learn about with spectral distortions. I see um, uh, more and more, uh, how to say, um, skepticism in the faces. So, uh, <laughs> and again, uh, just stop me and, and say, hey, explain that a bit better. Um, there are certain things that it's, it's, of course, it's a lot of things that I'm throwing at you right now, but I'm, I'm trying to just tickle you in the sense of there's so much interesting physics going on in the universe, right? So, uh, 
All right, so these are you know the classical figures again. Uh, Rashid Sunyaev and uh, Jakob Sadovich were actually the key people behind these uh, you know predictions, um, where the so-called Y-type distortion, which is similar to the sunyaev sadovich effect, where the CMB photons, just the black body spectrum, just gets basically partially moved upwards. You get energy injected into the spectrum, and that's how you get this. Uh, um, you know, this distortion where you remove photons at lower frequencies and they appear at higher frequencies. And you remember it before we showed the difference, which was like a deficit here and then an, an increment at higher frequencies. That was the picture that I showed with the sunyaev sadovich effect. In a similar way, you can produce the so-called chemical potential distortion. Now, that is a really interesting uh, distortion because if you fix the energy density of the microwave background and you fix the number density of the microwave background, photons, then um, usually when it's a black body, both of them are related by the temperature, right? And it's just one parameter describing both. But when you now say, I'm injecting energy and I'm increasing the energy density, but I'm not changing the number density of photons, you cannot have one parameter describing the full spectrum, right? And that's precisely the reason why you have a distortion. Naturally, you know, you immediately from just uh, global statements, you know there must be a distortion. So, for example, a line could be in the spectrum. There is a, a very narrow line or something. However, when you're in the early universe, Comptonization, so scattering by free electrons, will redistribute photons in such a way that they uh, become in, come into an equilibrium state. And that quasi-equilibrium is described by a chemical potential that's non-zero. So again, in statistical mechanics, you will almost certainly be told photon distributions always have chemical potential zero. That's nonsense. Only when it's equilibrium photon distributions, there will be a chemical potential zero. And even then, you can still say it's a, it's a kinetic equilibrium just between electrons and photons, which means it's not evolving very, very uh, strongly, but it's, it, it can have a non-zero chemical potential because of these you know, discrepancies between energy density and number density. Again, uh, one could go into the details there. But these two types of distortions are coming from very, from very, very different redshifts. So let me put this into context. Here's again a beautiful uh, picture of the history of the universe. Big Bang here, inflation era, so this is a little stretch now so that you can actually see different other eras, earlier eras. Then you have here you know, the reduction of, uh, of uh, hydrogen and helium, and then you get the recombination era again, 400,000 years after Big Bang, right? Redshift 1000, and then the late evolution where you have the structures of galaxies, uh, you know, structures form galaxies and stars, all these things. With seeing the anisotropy, so now I'm admitting that they exist, um, you know, you are trying to, by looking at the last scattering surface, at the picture of the last scattering surface, you're trying to learn about the initial stages like inflation and what's the bion density and so on. And then at late times, lensing effects, I told you, I told you about the Sunyaev Sedovich effect the large scale B and E modes, how they, you know, the E modes by lensing turn into B modes. All these things are what we are doing with seeing the anisotropies. With spectral distortions, we are basi basically testing the history of the universe in terms of energy release. And I'm cutting it off here roughly a couple of, of months after the Big Bang. Because when you go to earlier phases, Processes that allow you to restore equilibrium become so rapid that you can actually restore it and you would not see a distortion today. So if I uh, have a big cosmic explosion at like three minutes after the Big Bang, I would not be able to tell that in terms of the spectrum the spectral distortions because the energy that was emitted in or injected by that explosion would just be absorbed in the universe and it would be a black body again with a different temperature. Fully thermalized. Yeah? However, if you go something like two or three months after Big Bang, redshift of a million or, or, or so, when you go there, you can actually start seeing distortions. And uh, the way these distortions uh, are, are looking, so this is, as I said, already these probes, different phases of the thermal history of the universe and opens a, a window to early phases of the universe. And the spectral distortions that I mentioned before, the mu era is an era of very early distortion evolution because you need a very dense um, medium to actually produce this distortion. If you are uh, doing the Y-type distortion, so the sunyaev sedovich type distortion, right, just partial upscattering, you're in the regime where you don't have as much scattering. Uh, but when you're in the very early phases, you almost certainly get a lot of scattering, 
and that's when you get the kinetic equilibrium, uh, the mu distortion. So the mu distortion, which you can, here you can see how you estimate them if you just do this back of the envelope, it is basically nothing else than related to how much energy have you injected. Uh, uh, the mu distortion is an early universe distortion. All right, I'm looking at the time, and uh, I think I will, I will have to uh, uh, probably um, skip a, a few things, like half of the lecture or so, um, but that's okay. Uh, we, we now understand that this classical picture, which was developed in the 70s, that this is no longer true, and you can probably all guess, look, the transition between the mu distortion and the y distortion was just a sharp line in my previous figure, it was just saying, oh yeah, early phase mu, late phase y, that's not true. You have a transition between these two phases and you can actually show that the spectrum has a, a, a specific way of transitioning between all those phases. We can calculate these things now very accurately. And in addition, uh, you have uh, the so-called hydrogen and helium recombination spectrum, which imprints a much, much more complicated distortion than just the mu and y type distortion, which is really interesting. It comes from nothing else than hydrogen and helium atoms recombining at redshift 1000. And they are emitting photons when the electrons come into the uh, hydrogen atom. Yeah? All right, um, we can calculate these things now very well, but I, I want to uh, just highlight that we are really uh, seeing now how people are understanding that we can learn a lot more uh, about cosmology from these signals, and that, that's what I'm going to just spend the last minutes on, and then we can probably have a couple more questions, a couple questions, because there were no so far, maybe one. Um, so, I showed you already this beautiful result from Kobe Firas, and I highlighted uh, that this is, you know, parameterization of distortions, mu and y parameter, but the measurements have shown there is no distortion. These are upper limits, right? No detection of distortions. Why have I spent uh, the whole, uh, you know, talk on uh, talking about spectral distortions? Well, obviously, Firas was not the final word. It was just having a certain sensitivity, and we can now go beyond Firas uh, quite significantly. So if you here look at this very, very busy figure, uh, here you have again redshift, you know, the early phases, the late phases, and here is the Firas concept, and you can think of the vertical axis as signal strength. So Firas was up here, and there is unfortunately no expected distortion at that level. Uh, where here it's just marking the different types of distortions as I explained already, the Y distortion, the late phases, the, the transition between the two, and then the mu distortion in the early phases, and, 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 and that's the signals you should expect. However, when you go to more and more sensitive missions, you can open up the parameter space for distortions uh, that should be created by a new physics, but also expected physics. So the new physics is here in blue, the expected physics is the ones in, in, in yellow. So we have expected signals from the late universe, from ionization and structure formation, so clusters of galaxies and how they inject energy. We have late uh, distor we have distortions expected from early phases, from the so-called damping of acoustic modes in the universe. I showed you already the pattern in the sky, right? And that was I compared it with essentially oscillations in the universe uh, in stars, right? You have these oscillations at very very small scales as well. These are not visible anymore today, but they have had energy which can get released because of the oscillation stamping. It's like a dissipative process. And, and then we have the recombination lines which I mentioned, and I might show them because that's, uh, I'm very excited about those. They are really uh, um, have a nice structure. Um, in any case, this means there's lots of signals we could look for, some of them being guaranteed and some of them being uh, new physics probes. For example, primordial black holes or decaying particles axions, people talk about magnetic fields, superconducting strings, there's lots of new physics, particle physics, and uh, you know, other physics that you can probe with these spectral distortions in principle. Okay, and uh, this perspective has really stimulated a lot of you know, activity in the community. We have had many, many workshops, I don't want to go into de details, and have tried to identify what kind of science case we could go for with, with measuring these spectral distortions. Um, Here's a history of some experiments that were proposed or done. So FIRAS, as I told you, one of the, the most important experiments, is still defining the state of the art in many ways. Because as we have uh, talked about, you know, Planck, WMAP, and COBE, 
Um, each of these are successors uh, of, of the early measurements, you know, the, the WMAP and Planck being successors of, of COBE. Um, they have improved the sensitivity, the resolution, so, you know, getting a more and more refined picture of the anisotropies and the sensitivity just being more sensitive to everything. But COBE Firas in spectral distortion business is still the state of the art. And this is not 25 years ago, but it's now 30 years ago that these measurements were done. I should update this slide. But uh, you can imagine how many times I've been talking about this already. Um, anyway, this is really important. We, we can experimentally go beyond FIRAS now very, very, very uh, clearly. And um, I just want to here basically show this one slide that summarizes some of the activities that people have been talking about and options. Uh, so we have tried to put, oh, excuse me, we have tried to put forward space missions. Uh, multiple space missions. Unfortunately, they didn't get selected at this point. Uh, something is wrong with my slides. Uh, but we have also, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, proposed missions like balloon-borne missions and also ground-based missions that uh, experiments that could be actually pushing the frontier finally. So there's a really, really positive uh, perspective there. And I want to show you uh, that some of this is even not just fiction. So this is the slide that is uh, coming without me wanting it. Um, COSMO is one experiment that our Italian colleagues are trying to push forward and here's uh, Elia Battistelli and uh, Silvia Masi, these are from the University of Rome in, uh, in La Sapienza in Rome and then uh, Paolo De Bernardis who is, who is one of the main people of this experiment they are actually building the cryo cryostat you know and here, and here you can see how they are playing with this and I went and visited them uh, a couple of, uh, you know, actually earlier this year. And I was like, look, guys, I, I don't believe that you have anything. Show me. And they were like, OK, cool. Here's, for example, some of the detector devices and aspects of that. Um, here's some of the chips. And I was really proud because with my, with my iPhone, I was able to get like the, you know, small little reflection patterns of the light and so on, which, were, you know, required me being an experimentalist. Um, so this was uh, really, really amazing to see. This is no longer just fiction, and it's really happening now. And uh, uh, one of the key things, and maybe I will stop there before I show the recombination lines because they're really cool. Um, uh, we have, with the efforts that we have made to stimulate the community to go for these spectral distortion signals, to probe all these you know, new opportunities, we have actually managed to get recognized by the Voyage 2050 uh, space program. So this is, of course, long term, but you are the young generation. So you guys, in principle, you know, you should be preparing for measuring these signals. Um, uh, uh, it was, you know, recognized with this report that spectral distortions are one of the key, uh, uh, could be one of the key new probes of the early universe, of the early universe physics. And um, that is uh, uh, extremely exciting because it means that there is now, of course, a good motivation to think about how can we measure this, how can we come up with an experimental uh, setup that really will do this and get the community involved and really, really start uh, preparing for this. Uh, it's a long time frame, but it is really something that uh, will happen. And I think um, it's clear that one needs to start now, even if it's 30 years away, space missions, or 20 years, space missions always take a long time to really Get, get flying and then, you know, uh, motivate them and produce them and all this. This always takes a long, long time. Uh, so it's important to get involved now. And activities like COSMO, which I mentioned more explicitly, but then also BZU and TMS, which are all suborbital activities, they will be really important for getting there. So uh, this is something that will happen on the next five to ten years from now. So this is exciting. It will, you know, m make a lot of motion in this direction. Okay. And as I promised, I will stop here, but I will show you the, uh, the recommendation lines. Um, okay, don't be shocked how many slides I have. There's lots of physics here. Here's the recommendation lines. So this is really the lines of hydrogen and helium coming from the Redshift 1000 universe. When the electrons, which are free initially, recombine with the hydrogen atom, they, of course, can recombine to the highly excited states of hydrogen, and then by dipole transitions we'll just emit photons, which you can then see as a function of frequency as we would be observing them today. And this is like what I always uh, call the fingerprint of the recombination era, because the shape of these lines imprints exactly when did recombination happen, how did it happen, what's the duration of it, and all these things. 
which allows us to directly probe recombination physics at rich of 1,000, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So normally, I mean, we would offer, these calculations are based on the normal standard, you know, hydrogen atom and helium atom, how we can really calculate it with quantum mechanics and quantum electrodynamics and all this. Um, but of course, the universe, you know, who tells you that everything works that way, and in particular, uh, the assumptions going into the approximations that are going into this, because you can't just brute force calculate it, um, there might be some assumptions that are wrong. And if we look at these lines, we will be able to, t to tell um, how, these, uh, how these processes have happened. And this is really the last slide. Um, uh, these hydrogen and helium lines, they come all from different eras of the universe. So I told you about the semi-anisotropies anisotropies and the last scattering surface, Reg of 1000. That's where you can think of them coming from. Um, and then here you have the hydrogen lines at different phases. Uh, here you're seeing the uh, free electron fraction as a function of time, just saying, okay, initially everything is ionized and then it gradually recombines. And at the late stages, everything is neutral because you have recombined. And uh, the emission of these lines, they come from earlier phases than the last scattering surface. So you can actually learn about different phases of the universe, again, with these recombination lines, which is really exciting to think about. So I think I will stop there and just show this one sum summary slide um, that tries to just say spectral distortions with these different signals, the mu y type distortions and their transition, as well as the recombination lines as a target from, you know, from this redshift 1000 universe, if you will, these signals, they allow you to test, you know, what's going on in the cosmos in phases that we have no access to otherwise. There are signals that are guaranteed that you can look for. You can even design your experiment to measure them. This is very, very challenging. That's the reason why it might take another 20, 30 years before we see any of the cosmologically important signals. But it is really a prediction of our cosmology and it should be tested. And it will be, you know, opening uh, both a huge uh, discovery potential, has a huge discovery potential and opens a new window to the early universe, but it will also test, as I said, the universe in different phases. And uh, there's like many, many other things I could have talked about in addition. So for example, we have connection with 21 centimeter cosmology. We, have to, uh, we can do things with uh, line intensity mapping. All these probably uh, are you know, something that you have not heard about. And we can even do anisotropic spectral distortion. So I told you, CMB anisotropic temperature, spectrum, just the monopole. We can now do the anisotropies as well. So there's so many things that one can really calculate and study. Um, that you know, 20 years is probably going to be a lot of uh, you know. That's, that, uh, it's not even that much time in that sense, you know. So yeah, I will stop there and hopefully.